first thing that struck me as I started to read that passage from 1 Samuel was that it was a written record of a human being hearing with their ears God's voice. It's not the first time that God spoke directly to somebody, but I think it would be fair to say that often God chose to speak through a messenger, an angel, or a prophet to deliver the message rather than speaking directly. Our reading from John's Gospel describes part of the ministry of John the Baptist and his testimony about Jesus. Verse 32, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I find it interesting that in Matthew's account of the same incident, he also describes the Spirit's descent, but adds, And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. A voice from heaven. From that point onwards, God spoke not from heaven, but through the physical voice of his beloved Son. God spoke to an ailing human race through a human voice of Jesus of Nazareth. But of course we remember that Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. Over the years, I guess, that quite a few of us will recall somebody saying to us something like this. Well, God told me. I guess many a Christian counsellor will have heard a similar response when a client was questioned about why they chose a particular course of action. The sceptic in me, and I'm not a counsellor, would wonder if that was said to strengthen the real reason, which was actually to do what they wanted to do. Or was it really God's leading? As I prepared this sermon for this evening, it made me wonder, how do people hear from God? A voice heard in the still watches of the night, like young Samuel? Or was it a strong thought that came to them in the wakeful silence? Was it a voice speaking in a dream? Remember Joseph being warned to take Mary and the baby Jesus to Egypt to escape Herod's slaughter of the innocents. Nothing quite so dramatic, but some people today would say that God spoke to them in a dream, or perhaps that God spoke to them through a dream, and there is a difference. I'll come back to that a bit later. Others might say that God spoke through a word from a stranger, a confidant, a counsellor, a pastor, even a preacher. Still others would say that God spoke to them through a Bible reading, here in church or privately at home. And perhaps that should come as no surprise. Of course God used human beings to write the scriptures, but as Christians we believe that God inspired those words. So God can and does speak through the written word, and I'll come back to that later. When you think about it, we're all very different, and surely God will communicate with us in a way which is best for us. As many of you may recall, I used to be a teacher, a chemistry teacher, and in those days we were very aware of the different ways in which a student can learn best. Three broad categories, visual learners, auditory learners, kinesthetic learners. A visual learner will gain a great deal from simply reading a textbook or words written up on the blackboard with chalk. My word, that dates me. <laughs> An auto well, it was 2002 that I retired. <laughs> An auditory learner simply needs to listen, and that can be a problem sometimes. A student is staring out of the window, apparently paying not a blind bit of notice to what you're saying. You challenge them and they could repeat word for word exactly what you've been saying. <laughs> a my grandson was like that. A kinesthetic learner needs to be physically involved in the process. And that's a real advantage with a practical subject like chemistry. Not watching the teacher demonstrate, like when I was a boy, 
but actually doing the experiments themselves. As I said just now, we are all different, and how we hear from God will be tailored to our own strengths and weaknesses. I reckon that might well change as we go through life's little hiccups, even its mountaintop or deep, dark valley experiences. It might also change as we get older and how far we have grown in our faith. I spoke earlier about coming back to something a little later. God speaking in and through a dream, and God speaking very clearly through his written word. I guess it may not be usual in an evening service, but I felt prompted to give a word of personal testimony this evening. Some of you might be familiar with some, but perhaps not the whole picture. It all began in 2004, when our daughter Claire told us that she and Ben and the four children were moving to Australia. She told us that God was involved in that decision. She told us that God and they were already in contact with the leaders of a church in Perth. And who were we to argue with that? To be honest, we were pretty devastated by that news. Claire and Ben were both working and Patricia had a major role to play in childcare, and then that was to be snatched away. Over the weeks that followed, Pat and I wondered if God wanted us to emigrate as well. The family left just after Easter, and that autumn Pat and I went out to Perth on a three-month visa to test the water. We lived independently, had our own apartment, hired a car and so on. And the test resulted in a very clear no. We were not meant to emigrate with them. Before we left England, Claire warned me that their church, which was a large city centre Pentecostal church, wasn't like anything that we had experienced here in Frinton. What on earth was a Pentecostal church, I wondered. Over the months, I'd written to the senior pastor with some very serious questions. By the time we arrived, there were many questions outstanding. On our arrival, Claire asked me to read a book edited by John Arnott called Experience the Blessing. I also had weekly meetings with one of the junior pastors, finding out more and more about the so-called Toronto Blessing, baptism of the Holy Spirit, or as Graham said last Sunday, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Looking back, I can quite clearly see that God developed in me a hunger to experience the blessing for myself. Through my reading of that remarkable book, I saw that the individual contributors had gone to Toronto either to disprove it was from God, like R.T. Kendall of Westminster Chapel, or simply to receive the blessing. Incidentally, R.T. Kendall came back from Toronto a changed and chastised man. He went on his knees before his congregation and told them that he was wrong. It is from God. What impressed me about the book was that all the contributors told of the real blessing and a new dynamic on their ministry. No time to go into the detail. Suffice to say, I wanted that blessing upon my role as a lay preacher. By now I'd retired from teaching and was preaching in many churches of different denominations in this area right up into South Suffolk. On the last Sunday before we returned to the UK, it was then that it happened. The Holy Spirit fell upon me. It was unlike anything I had ever experienced before. There was a profound warmth, uncontrolled tears, hardly able to breathe, and yet throughout it all was it an incredible sense of peace and joy. Once back in Frinton, life carried on pretty much as normal. By then I'd taken a few preaching engagements in a small church in Dovercourt, Kingsway Evangelical Church. At one point I discovered that their pastor was leaving. 
A week or so later, I was out in the fields walking our two dogs, and I suddenly had a very powerful thought. Maybe I should ho offer to help out with the church when they were without a leader, reduce my time preaching in the other churches. So strong was the thought, I told Pat about it when I got back from the walk. That's strange, she said. I had a vivid dream last night about how we became joint pastors of that church. We thought it was more than coincidence, so I rang the church secretary. One thing led to another, and five months later, after I returned from Australia, we became pastors of that little church. Surely God had had a plan for us, and now we were right in the thick of it. So, a dream and a waking thought on a walk, when God spoke very clearly to both of us. But what about him speaking through the Holy Scriptures? Two years into my ministry and the church was now very different. Many young people had joined the church. The Holy Spirit was moving powerfully in some people's lives. But there were some members who didn't like what was happening to their church. Their opposition grew. And a week before the annual general meeting, I heard that this group were going to ask for a vote of no confidence in my leadership, and they wanted my resignation. I knew they weren't exactly happy, but I had no idea that it was as bad as that. Maybe I'd got it wrong. Maybe the changes I felt led to make were not from God. I agonised in prayer. Lord, I don't know what I should do. Should I resign? I prayed and I prayed. Lord, I still don't know what to do. I can't hear your voice. Please speak to me through your word. My daily reading was always a passage from the narrated Bible. Through the whole Bible in a year, but in chronological order. Day after day went by, and there was nothing. Nothing I read seemed in any way to relate to my situation. The night before the AGM, I read a passage for the day. Isaiah's middle chapters. Nothing. Maybe I ought to read tomorrow's reading as well. Again, there was nothing. Help me, Lord! And then I came to Isaiah 41. The first eight verses didn't seem to do very much. But oh boy, from verse 9. I took you from the ends of the earth. Can't get much further away than Australia. From its farthest corner I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Then as now I could hardly read the words through the tears. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. As you can imagine, I slept soundly that night. The following evening, the AGM went without a hitch. Not one voice was raised from any of that group at any point in the meeting. From that point on in the church's history, the Holy Spirit had complete freedom. We saw miracles, we saw healing, lives were changed, and the church grew and grew. It was an amazing witness to the love of God reaching out into the pretty godless society of Harwich and Dovercourt. In my fourth year there, God made it clear that I should retire and hand over the reins to someone a lot younger. That decision was not easy, 
because life in the church was just so exciting. But it was taking its toll on me and the family. That role was the hardest work I had ever done, physically, mentally, and especially spiritually. But it was the most incredible experience. So that was me. God spoke in different ways to us at different stages. What about everyone else? I believe that God has his way of speaking to each one of us in exactly the right way at exactly the right time. It could be a physical voice, a very clear thought that comes without prompting. It could be through a dream or reading our Bibles. And suddenly a passage we may have read dozens of times before will out of the blue hit us right where we need. The verses might provide the answer to our persistent prayers, begging God to intervene in some way. But we do need to remember that in his supreme wisdom, his answer might still be no. The scripture might also contain a rebuke. It could provide us with the strength we need to face a crisis in the family, our own discomfort, sadness, death, our own impending demise or that of a loved one. God will speak to us if we ask him to, and he can break through any barrier which we might have created between him and us. He can break through it. He will speak to us. He will find a way in which his voice can be heard and for that we give him our thanks and our praise. Amen.